Good afternoon. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are coming back this afternoon to take another uh, walk through the draft um, bill around creation of uh, task force and uh, and membership and duties of the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. Um, we have taken a look at uh, gone gone once through the changes that were made in response to the testimony that we heard last week and conversations that we had over the weekend. And I wanted to give uh, members uh, the opportunity to go through this one more time um, because it is my intention that we will um, move this bill out of committee tomorrow. And so I'd like to go through one more time right now uh, so that we can give some direction to legislative council if there are any things that we um, think need to be redrafted to look at uh, a more final draft in the morning. And so um, Becky Wasserman, thank you so much for being with us uh, this afternoon. We, uh, we gave our vice chair the duty to walk us through the last, um, the last uh, time we walked through the bill. And I think um, I'll let you go ahead and guide us through the bill this time. Um, I will let you know when I hear uh, or see questions um, so that if folks have uh, questions or suggestions or uh, need clarification on anything, um, we'll pause and take a moment to, uh, to discuss what we're looking at. Sure. Um, so I'll just start. I know you went through it already, but you just want me to start from the beginning again. Yep. Let's right. go through um, section by section and um, give folks an opportunity to uh, ask any final questions or um, express any desire to discuss changes. Great. Uh, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council, this is draft 1.2 of um, the drafting request uh, 0967. It does not have a bill number yet because it has not been introduced, but it's uh, relating to the membership and duties of the Vermont Pension Investment Committee and the creation of the Pension Benefit Design and Pension Benefits Design and Funding Task Force. Um, so on page one, uh, what, it, what is first highlighted there is uh, the renaming of that task force and the renaming of the title to incorporate um, some of the changes that were made. Um, so the task force is the benefits design and funding task force um, because now the uh, duties of that task force have been expanded. So it's reflecting uh, what those responsibilities would be. Um, so in section one of the bill, um, this is amending the VPIC sec statutory section of law. Um, in the definition section in section 521, there is um, highlighted in, ye in yellow at the top of page two, a new definition of independent. So that new de definition includes um, independent means an individual who does not have a direct or indirect material interest in the plans. And then there's some additional clarifying language. Um, so an individual has a direct or indirect material interest if uh, one the individual or their spouse, parent, child, sibling, or in-law is a beneficiary of any of the plans or if the individual or the uh, any of the those family members of the individual um, has been within the past five years an employee, director, officer, consultant, owner, uh, I see consultant is here twice, so I need to correct that, um, manager or, or had another material role with an entity servicing the plan. Um, and then there's also some clarifying language on what it means to be an owner. Um, so an owner of a publicly traded company is someone who uh, owns directly or indirectly 5% or more of a class of the company's equity securities registered on, under the Security Exchange Act. All right. Um, I will keep going. I don't see any questions. So section 522 is the membership of VPIC. I added some language here in subsection A under 
uh, on line uh, 19 to clarify that this is an independent committee. Um, and this is just sort of speaking to the committee's independence from the treasurer's office. And there's some more clarifying language with respect to that um, later on in the section. The, Current statutory language has VPIC um, attached to the treasurer's office. So this is um, trying to get to the fact that it's an independent committee. Um, and I think that there's also some language on a consultant doing a, a study of how to make it a separate legal entity. So um, I'm not sure if this is a committee discussion point, but if this is sufficient for now for um, sort of being explicit that this committee is independent. Uh, Representative Hooper. So I didn't realize the impact of the top part and the bottom part before, but Becky, will this language, essentially the bill is effective upon passage, um, throw somebody out into the middle of the wilderness alone? Um, what's the caveat that keeps the BFIC functioning during the period of time when this is in transition before the report is issued and accepted or whatever? Um, sure, so I'll, I'll get to this a little bit later on in the language, but the committee still has the administrative um, and I believe technical support of the treasurer's office. So it is not changing the support that it receives from the treasurer's office. It is just not attached to it as um, sort of a, a division of the treasurer's office. So then where is it? I mean, if you're, um, it's got to exist someplace in state government. It's got to be under something. It seems to just be floating in the Netherland after this. Uh, so right now it's it's not um, under a specific office. I think the request uh, was to make it independent. I, I would say more typically I see this with um, boards than committees. I think there are more, more examples of that, but I think it's uh, taking that kind of uh, structure where it's an independent board or independent committee um, rather than being like under uh, you know, the Secretary of Administration or, for example. Um, so like the Labor Board or something like that? Yeah, so um, I believe like the, the Green Mountain Care Board might be another example or where it's an independent board. And do they normally have appropriations to? Um, so so the, there is some language in here that I'll get to that says that for any expenses incurred by the committee, they may collect um, payment proportionally from each retirement system. Um, and uh, as well as they can collect payment for any of the in expenses incurred by the treasurer's office for providing administrative support to them. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the membership of the committee, um, there's one member and one alternate that is elected by uh, the board of the Vermont State Employees Retirement System. Um, one member and one alternate elected by uh, the members of the uh, state teachers retirement system and then a member and alternate elected by the members of the municipal retirement system. Um, there are two members and one alternate who are each uh, financial experts and independent that are appointed by the governor. The state treasurer is a voting member of the board. The committee chair um, is elected by, appointed by the nine other members of the committee. Um, and then the, there was a change here. The commissioner of financial regulation is now on the board um, and then finally, the, there's an, a municipal employer member appointed by the ED of the League of Cities and Towns, and then a school employer appointed by the School Boards Association. Um, and I, I had some notes that your discussion earlier 
uh, there was some discussion around the it, municipal and school employers and, and whether uh, you, you wanted to change how that was phrased. So I don't know if that was uh, decided yet. <laughs> Uh, we can certainly have some committee discussion about that. Um, I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure that we came to a consensus about what we intended that to be, and and therefore we still need to design what language uh, gets at what we uh, have consensus around what uh, what we're trying to get to. So, anyone want to weigh in on that? I think we're going to have to flag that for a fresh look, maybe over a morning cup of coffee or something. I'm not sure. Um, Rep. Gannon. Um, as I suggested earlier, I thought maybe just putting in representative of a municipal employer, representative of a school employer, with the assumption that the school employer is a school district or supervisory, supervisory union, and the municipal employer would be a, a city or town. That makes me peaceful. Um, I'm not sure how other people are feeling about it and any, if folks have different concerns. Nobody's diving. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, that actually works for me, Madam Chair. I think it leaves us the flexibility and latitude to get the right people on there. And I see a thumbs up if, Folks are okay with that. All right, excellent. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for crafting a phrase that works. Uh, Rip Lafave. Sorry, I was just saying I agreed with that. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you. I agree with it too. I, 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 I keep remembering that there's <clears throat> language elsewhere to urge appointing authorities to focus on the issue of expertise. And I assume that that language, uh, if you like, is permeates the whole bill, including this section we're now focused on. <clears throat> and if it doesn't, I'd make that explicit. So the financial expertise requirement is not um, required of the member representing a municipal employer or the member representing a school employer or the independence requirement. I still think it would be useful, but that's what we're aiming for anyway. Representative Hooper. Uh, I tend to agree with Peter. However, that second comment about the requirement that they not be independent uh, threw up a flag in the context of why not? Committee discussion. Rep. Gannon. Um, as, as I explained, um, based on some feedback I got from Tom Galanka um, from the Vemers um, representative on VPIC, their concern was that if we had an independence requirement with respect to these two positions, um, then a superintendent um, or a town manager who would likely be beneficiaries of a, a, a pension and would not be able to serve. I thought we, excuse me for being obtuse, I thought we sort of basically said you weren't not independent if you were a beneficiary. Did I miss that no. conversation? The definition of independent includes being a beneficiary of a pension. Uh, excuse me. Okay. 
So that is on uh, page two, lines uh, three through five. Mm -hmm. No, I thought I heard we were going to exclude beneficiaries not being that significant, but fine. It would be my hope that um, that if either of these entities wanted a town manager or superintendent to be appointed and found that someone had a level of ex expertise that they thought was beneficial to represent their uh, organization that we, they would be able to appoint them. So um, I think I am comfortable with the language in front of us. If other people are, can we have a thumbs up? All right. Okay. Um, would you like me to just go through the highlighted language or just kind of go through the whole bill right now? Um, I think we should go through the whole bill. We, okay. we um, focused largely on the highlighted sections before and I just wanna okay. make sure that folks have a, a fresh view of all of the way the whole thing fits together so that we can close this down tomorrow morning. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to the top of page four, subsection B is the training sec section. Um, so both members and alternates of the committee would be required to participate in onboarding and ongoing uh, periodic training requirements uh, in investment securities and fiduciary responsibilities. And the committee would also provide an annual report to the authorities that elected or appointed those members and alternates regarding their attendance at these uh, trainings and educational programs. Um, subsection C has to deal with, uh, deals with member terms. So except for the um, ex officio members of the committee, all members of the committee are serving staggered four-year terms. Uh, vacancy created before the expiration of a term is filled um, is done so in the same ma manner as the original appointment. A member that's appointed to fill a vacancy created before uh, the expiration of that term is not deemed to have served a term for the purpose of the, the subsection. And um, in terms of eligibility, members are eligible for reappointment, but they cannot serve more than three years, so a total of uh, 12 years. Some new language that was added um, requires that if a member is, can only be removed from the board, uh, sorry, this should say the committee, I will fix that, from the committee uh, for cause, um, and that the committee shall adopt rules um, pursuant to uh, the APA, which is uh, 3 VSA chapter 25, to define the basis and process for that removal. Uh, Representative Anthony has a question. I, I think uh, in your absence, uh, Becky, this is a point at which at least uh, I thought it would be um, useful to be clear as to whether we were counting the years already served by people who were going to continue on. And I, I still go back to my uh, attitude back then, which is, we start with a clean slate. And so the aforementioned limits, 12 years, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would be applicable from the day that the, uh, the commission is reconstituted. Um, so there, there is language in the transition section um, on page uh, 12. Um, that says current members and alternates may be reappointed if they meet the eligibility qualifications and term limit requirements um, in 3 VSA 522. So I think this does address that situation of if you have a, a current member or alternate who has, let's say, served eight years, that they're still subject to that 12-year term limit requirement if they are reappointed to another term. Um, 
that is a discussion point that the committee will um, need to make a decision on. Um, I, I, it was my intention that um, that term limits would not start afresh at zero uh, once we reconstitute the committee, but that time served would count towards one's term on the pension investment committee. Uh, happy to have a committee discussion about that. Uh, Representative Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Odd, odd that you should use the word time served because sometimes I think it feels like that. Um, <laughs> I, I think as uh, John mentioned earlier in the day, we're expecting a, a turnaround in the action of what VPIC has done recently. And uh, I would be in favor of starting the clock over rather than disrupting or blowing up maybe what is working all of a sudden. Uh, it's my opinion. All right, this is a decision point for the committee. And since we're on this uh, question right now, um, let's go ahead and have some committee discussion. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, do we have any specific specifics of, of the people and time served to date that we're, we can use as a reference? Meaning, do we have the tenure of the current membership of the committee? Much, much better said, Madam Chair, yes. Yeah, and um, I don't know uh, if, I don't have that uh, immediately in front of me. I don't know, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if you did some digging to, to figure that out. It's not immediately easy to find. You're correct, Madam Chair. It's not easy to find. Um, I did request that information from Tom Galaco, who then forwarded it to Eric Henry, and I have not received a response at this point. Um, other hey. committee discussion on time served versus start the clock afresh. Great. An, an answer to that question would help me some. If we have a lot of people who are 10 years into the 12 years, might be worthy of a conversation. But if we've got people who are fairly new to the positions and the 12 years isn't a major concern, then uh, I could go either way. Uh, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that information would be helpful for me as well, but right now I'm leaning towards starting the clock anew. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments, or um, suggestions on this? Um, because it sounds like we'll need to come back to this uh, in hopes that we can get more information before before we make a final decision. I would ask that if anyone's got that information in front of them that they actually email that to the House Government Operations Committee. Um, that way our committee assistant can uh, put that information up on our committee page so that folks who may be following along from home can also see the answer to, the, to that question. Uh, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering, because we talk about how hard it is to get people, if we also have on record, if there has been any vacancies and how long it took to fill that vacancy. Uh, Representative Hooper. Madam Chair, I might be able to address parts of those questions if you grant me leave. Um, 
I stuck in the chat prior to realizing what the question actually was that Rob was asking. Uh, this is term expiration. Off the top of my head, I could say probably who's new and who isn't. Um, and as to Representative Fave's question, generally speaking, the employee boards do their elections immediately or a little bit before. The uh, governor's appointees seem to take a while to fill, but the person that's in the seat doesn't leave until the new one is appointed. So there's really not ever a quote unquote vacancy. Thank you. Um, so let's uh, keep an eye on our email. And if, uh, and if we get an answer to that question via email, we'll post it under um, documents for the day. Uh, let's flag this, Rebecca, if that's okay, and we'll come back to the to the issues about uh, time served versus reset. Okay. Um, so then I'll move on to the chair's um, limits. So the chair shall serve not more than twenty years on the committee, um, and that is a combo of serving as a chair or committee member. Um, the committee can elect an interim chair who has to have uh, financial expertise or, or be independent um, if the chair is unable to perform his or her duties. Representative Hooper. Okay. Uh, a, a technical question maybe towards the issue of uh, terms. If you're, not, if you're an alternate, are you considered to have been a member under this, because an alternate is technically not. So if you've been an alternate for eight years, um, I would assume that doesn't count towards your. Um, that's a, actually a great point. And this language does just references the members having staggered four year terms and a limit of three terms. Um, I am noticing that the original language uh, had that requirement for both members and alternates. So I can um, I can add that, I can add alternates into those term limits. If that is what the committee is looking to do. <laughs> so you can be an alternate for a specific and then you can be a member for a specific if you get promoted, um, quote unquote? So, I mean, I, I guess this is a, committee decision. I'm, I'm just pointing to the original, the current mm -hmm. language, which says um, that both the alternates and the members serve for um, four-year terms. So that is a policy decision point for us. Representative Gannon. I mean, I think that term limits should apply to both alternates and members. Um, because I think the same issues um, come up with people who serve lengthy periods of time on a board, whether that's in a member position or not. And as, as I understand BPEC, the alternates attend all of BPEC meetings. They're allowed to speak during the meetings. Um, they're just not allowed to vote. Representative Anthony. I agree with the vice chair and I was linking uh, my reset uh, contribution with whether uh, I am personally comfortable with distinguishing the chair with a longer term or not, uh, given that Mr. Galanka has already served for three years. And uh, if there's no reset, I, I think it, it would be unfortunate, but I'm sympathetic to shortening the uh, uh, distinguishing length for the chair if it's a reset. Uh, but I, I agree with John, the delegates and the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, alternates and, and members ought to be treated uh, in tandem, that is to say, identically in terms of accrued time. Right, so can we just draw poll the question of whether alternates and uh, members are 
treated the same. Are, if you are comfortable with alternates and, uh, and VPIC members being treated the same for the purposes of term limits. Uh, seeing a few hands. Okay, mostly ups and, and one down um, and a couple of abstentions. We still have to make a final decision, I think, as a committee about whether, uh, whether we're going with resetting the clock at zero or, um, or counting time already served, but um, we can come back to that question. Other committee discussion on either of these points? Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. That, that question, it's only got to do with this particular point in time, correct? So it's just kind of a once and done discussion. The transition language, yes. Yes. So knowing what we're looking at for tenure of existing members would be helpful for me. All right, back to the language. Sure, um, so moving on to subdivision three on page five, so I'm on a uh, term shall end on June 30th and new terms begin on July 1st. Um, and then uh, notwithstanding the term limits uh, members and I'll include alternates here, shall serve until their successors are appointed subject to the term limits provided in this subsection. Um, so that makes sure that there is no va vacancy on the committee until someone is appointed. Um, in terms of the chair and the vice chair, um, the chair of VPIC uh, shall be a non-voting member except in the case of a tie vote and the committee shall elect a vice chair from among its members. Uh, top of page six, eligibility. Uh, no legislator who's currently serving in the General Assembly shall serve on the committee. Representative Gannon has a question. Um, yeah, and this is a question, you know, for Representative Hooper. Um, I was just wondering about the diversity of the VPIC members today. I mean, one of the reasons to have um, board changeover or term limits is as our, our population changes, um, it gives an opportunity to have more diversity on boards. And both public and nonprofit entities are really focused on encouraging diversity on their boards. And so I was just wondering if you could identify um, the, the diversity that's currently on VPIC. Uh, there are no people of color, and if you consider the six members who are not the alternates, I think um, Beth, Mary Alice, and Kim, um, one is a governor's appointee, one is the treasurer, one is a municipal board, and then the other rep is myself. Uh, Joe Mackey, and I think John Henry Huber, Hubert or something like that. So it looks like in the voting members of EPIC, it might be 3-3. Three, three. Alternate wise, we just had a very strong voice from the female side of the aisle die. I think she's had an appointment uh, at, at this point. I'm not sure if it's been approved. Um, and I can't really speak to the governors. Uh, uh, there's an alternate that is a male for me. Uh, the alternate for the teachers was a female. Uh, the municipal, I think the alternate is a male. He used to be the actual voting member. They switched seats. If that's what you're asking. Thank you. Um, so I'll move 
to the, oh, sorry, was there a committee discussion on the eligibility? Um, so in terms of uh, committee meetings, uh, five members of committee constitute a quorum. Uh, if a member is not in attendance, the alternate of that member shall be el eligible to act as a member um, during their absence. Uh, the committee needs five concurring votes to be necessary for a decision at any meeting. Um, subsection G, leave leave time, so public employee members and alternates are granted reasonable leave time to attend committee meetings and um, education programs. Rep Behovsky has a question. Thank you. I don't know that this is actually a question for Legislative Council. I'm just trying to really quickly wrap my head around things and do some math. Why would it be five and not six? Wouldn't we want 50% plus one as opposed to just half of the committee to make a decision? Um, so there, there are nine voting members, unless there's a tie, there's 10. The, a lang the previous draft had six um, members needed for a quorum, and I believe this was a request from VPIC to change that from a supermajority to just a, a simple majority of five. Rep Cannon. Yes, I wanted to confirm that that was a request from VPIC um, and the, the language change that I asked um, Becky to make was that um, it would only be a super majority um, for setting the assumed rate of return, which I think is the most critical decision that VPIC makes. Any other questions on that? Great, I think we're on to H. Okay. Uh, so compensation and reimbursements. Um, the members who are not public employees are entitled to reimbursement for necessary expenses um, for, for their service on the committee and the chair of the committee may be compensated um, at a level not to exceed one third of the salary of the state treasurer. And Representative Gannon. Uh, just so for Becky's information, um, there there was, and I don't know if you caught this or not, there was a discussion about having a compensation study related to the compensation of the chair. Yes, and there is, um, I did see notes on that. Um, there is language in the uh, consultant study that says that the report is including a review of budgetary authority, frequency of trainings, transfer or hiring of personnel and compensation. Um, would you like me to be more specific of uh, compensation of, of chair and uh, employees or is, is it, does the language work as is? Um, probably, if you said chair and employees, because VPIC will have um, employees moving forward. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, just let me find my place again. Uh, so then um, in terms of assistance and expenses and subdivision, uh, subsection I, um, so I, I referenced this earlier that the committee shall have the administrative and technical support of the office of the state treasurer. Um, in terms of funding, the committee can collect proportionally from the funds of the three retirement systems and any individual municipalities that have been allowed to invest their retirement funds uh, through, through the committee. Um, any expenses incurred that are associated with carrying out its duties, as well as any expenses incurred by the treasurer's office in support of the committee. Um, and then finally, the, the attorney general serves as legal advisor to the committee. Okay. 
In terms of the committee's duties, um, they are responsible for the investments of the assets of each retirement system. Um, and they, the committee uh, has to strive to maximize total return on investments um, in accordance with the standards of care under the prudent investor rule. So this is all current statutory language. Um, the committee can enter into agreements with municipalities about administering their own retirement systems. Um, the state treasurer serves as custodians of the funds of all three retirement systems. And uh, VPIC can also enter into agreements with um, the state treasurer to invest the state employees and teachers, or em teachers OPEB fund. In terms of the committee's powers and duties, um, so the committee shall set the following actuarial assumptions, the investment rate of return, the inflation rate and the smoothing rate method used for the actuarial valuation of assets and returns. Um, not more than 180 days after the end of each fiscal year, and this was a change from the previous draft, which had it at 90 days, um, the committee has to um, conduct an asset allocation study that reviews expected return of each fund, um, and that looks at risk analysis using best practices methodologies to estimate potential risks to the fund's assets over a five, 10, and 20 year period, and the remainder of the statutory amortization period. Um, I have highlighted here that the study would be sent to the General Assembly, the governor, and made publicly available on the state treasurer's website within 10 days. Um, I think there was some discussion last time about whether it should go to a specific committee rather than the General Assembly. Um, and whether posting it on the state treasurer's website was the correct place to, to do so. I would think that House and Senate government operations at a minimum should, uh, should be recipients of that. Representative Anthony. Definitely concur, and I even put a date on it, uh, like right after the gavel falls in January. <coughs> well, the, the date, the, uh, the, the materials is, are collected, and anyway, there there is the date of not more than 180 days after the end of each fiscal year. So, okay, um, that would would typically be by the end of the year, end of December. Mm -hmm. And uh, I. If you'll excuse me, Madam Chair, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but <clears throat> right after we just listed the uh, assumptions and the actions that the um, um, members, in the case of the rate of return, a supermajority of VPIC, I wonder if it's worth, um, I know we've added it, and I thank you very much to the task force. I wonder if it's uh, worth uh, simply saying, and by the way, um, that the rate of return shall remain at its current level until January 2024 or something to sort of settle the waters. No? I don't feel like that's a legislative uh, decision to make. Okay. To tell you the truth. Um, I, I wouldn't want to get into prescribing uh, what VPIC can and can't do in that way. Fair enough. Other, other committee discussion on that point? Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, to that point, which is, isn't why I raised my hand, but that's, I mean, that's a number that could really need to be changed quickly and it would make us fiduciaries of the plan to some degree, which I don't think we really want. Um, Becky, can you go back up to the, the treasurer shall be the custodian of the funds? Sure. What, does that, what does that really mean in the context of, we have a custodial bank that is under the purview of VPIC. 
the OPEB funds that Beth gave VPIC to manage, she put in the contract that she continues to be the custodian. But um, once again, this is sort of that everybody gets set adrift when this gets signed. I, I don't know where that leaves the custodian relationship because all the money's in the bank. If it's not invested, then it looks like this says Beth gets to write all the checks and I'm not entirely sure that's what we have now. Um, I think this might be a question for the treasurer's office on what this means in practice. Um, where did this for... come? Oh, that, that's current law. So I think maybe the treasurer's office could speak to okay. how what the current practice is in terms of being a custodian a custodian of the funds. So I didn't I didn't change that language. I was just um, sort of reviewing what was in statute currently. Okay, thank you. All right, back to the language. Um, and I, I am noting that I don't have the supermajority requirement for setting the actuarial assumptions. So I will add that into the next draft. Um, so uh, moving on to record keeping, um, the committee keeps a record of all of its proceedings, which uh, shall be open for public inspection. In terms of policies, the committee can formulate policies and procedures uh, to carry out its functions and what the responsibilities are of the chair. Um, there's some new language about the, um, the committee having policies with respect to their standards of conduct for um, members and employees of the committee. And um, I'll point this out later on, but in current law, this these standards of care are referenced in the individual board's statutory sections. And it says that the treasurer sets those standards. So for the committee standards of conduct, I have moved those to the committee statutory section and I'm having them create their own sta standards of, of conduct for, for their own committee rather than the treasurer. Um, but of course, this, this could be a, a question for committee discussion. <laughs> uh, Rep Hooper on standards of conduct. Uh, trying to click too many things at once here. Um, standards of conduct are pretty well prescribed in the fiduciary responsibility, but anything over and above that, uh, self-governance I think is a good thing. So if the committee determines that the treasurer's recommendations should go forward, that's fine. They can be modified. I don't think that's something that you should have to go to somebody else to get if that answered the question. Um, yeah, I mean, your hand was up, so I thought maybe you wanted to weigh uh, in on oh, oh. whether the committee should write their own standards of conduct. Uh, generally speaking, I think you're harder on yourself than somebody else might be, but that's... All right, everybody's peaceful with this language. Nobody's screaming, nobody's diving for their little hand raise function. So let's keep moving. Um, the subsection E is uh, contracting authority. So contracts approved by the committee may be executed by the chair or the vice chair in the chair's absence. Um, subsection F is an asset and liability study that's done every three years beginning July 1st of 2022. Um, so based on the most recent actuarial val valuations of the plan, um, the committee shall study the assets and liabilities of each plan over a 20 year period. That study looks at um, projecting the expected path of the key indicators of each plan's financial health based on all current and actuarial investment assumptions current contribution and benefit policies, and that includes um, the plan's mark-to-market funded ratio, actuarial required contributions by source, 
payout ratio and related liquidity obligations. And then also projects the effect on the plan's financial health resulting from um, possible material deviations from the plan assumptions and investment assumptions and possible material deviations from key plan actuarial assumptions. Um, and that looks at retiree longevity, potential benefit increases and inflation. Uh, so subsection G, um, changes to actuarial rate of return. So any changes to that rate are made uh, solely by the committee. Um, subsection H, annual reports. So beginning January 15th of next year, uh, the committee sits, submits to the House and Senate Committee on Government Operations um, a few reports. The first is a report on the performance of each plan versus its demographic investment and other actuarial assumptions over a three, five, seven, and 10 year period. And the funding ratio of each plan to each plan beneficiary at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, also a report on the status of the funding and investment performance of each plan and any relevant information from the asset liability and scenario testing completed during the prior fiscal year. Um, and then I believe this was discussed earlier about sending a, a written copy of the report to each participant and beneficiaries um, and the change that would be made would uh, be to uh, make it a written or electronic copy. Um, and uh, I have this written down uh, and to consolidate it with any other reports that are going out to, to members and beneficiaries. So in terms of section two, the transitioning of the member terms. Um, so beginning July 1st of this year, the there are three there are new member seats that will be appointed um so these are the uh commissioner of financial regulation the member representing a municipal employer and the member representing a school employer um so the municipal employer member representing municipal employer would serve an initial term of one year. And then the member representing the uh, school employer would serve an initial term of two years. And then it would start the four year staggered term after that. Um, and then the current members and alternates serving on the committee that as of the date the, the this bill is enacted, they serve until the year prior to the expiration of their current term or um, the later of June 30th, 2023. Um, and then this is the language that I think is still held for discussion of whether those members and alternate, alternates may be reappointed if they meet the, the eligibility and term requirements. And the staggering of the terms was done so that I believe there'll be, um, it, it just staggers from 2025 through 2027, um, the terms where new members are appointed so that not everybody is coming on board at the same time. Questions, comments, committee discussion? We're aiming to give some direction to legislative council if there's anything we decide as a committee that we would like to change about this so that we can be looking at as close to a final draft as possible in the morning. Representative Pigley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would this uh, section go towards answering maybe a little bit uh, of the other question that's still unanswered in regards to uh, uh, a start point for everybody? I mean, is it going to be difficult to, to look at the ones that are currently serving and, and work them into this, this staggered proposal easily? And, and maybe that might help us determine that we should, we should start it all at a, at a starting point. But 
Just, just a thought. Mm -hmm. so, so this does address the currently serving members and alternates. Um, those, uh, those expiration, the, the expiration of those terms span from uh, this year, I believe, until 2024. So it has a certain number of the current members um, being reappointed starting this year, um, but no later than 2023, depending on when their current term is expiring. So some of the current members will still be on the board until at least uh, June 30th, 2023. Thank you. Um, but it, it does, so this language to go to your other question says that does cap any reappointments at that 12 year term limit. So it, it does not answer, I, I guess it, this is still an, an open question of whether you wanna allow for longer periods of, of term limits for current members or just sort of say 12 is the most that you can serve on the committee, including past service. That's, Thank that's you. the decision point. Rep Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Becky, I'm looking at what I put in the chat, which has the expiration of terms in it. Was that what you were looking at? Which yes, from the VPEC website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this moves one section of terms back, and all of a sudden, we've got the teachers, the state employees. Uh, I don't really see the reason for this June 30th, 2023 date, because it looks like the way the terms are spread out now, they're pretty well spread out. I think it's not a matter of spreading out the terms. It's a matter of, um, it's, it's really a policy decision of the committee of getting uh, new members on the committee over a, a period of time. Um, but, it, you know, that's, I think, a, a question for the committee of letting the current members serve out their full terms, which would go until 2024. Um, but this, this language as drafted has everyone, all the current members and alternates ending their current terms one year early. Yeah, I see that. And So actually that would only impact uh, guys, the governor's appointee and the state employees appointees. It would impact everybody because the current um, municipal employee representative is expiring June 30th, 2022. So they would be reappointed uh, June 30th of this year. The uh, state teacher's representative is expiring June 30th, 2023. So it moves that, that representative back to June 30th, 2022. And then the two um, governor's appointees would be reappointed on, in 2021 because uh, their current terms are both expiring in 2022. So it, it impacts everyone equally in the sense that they're all having it lessened by one year. And my only comment, I guess, would be that it cuts into the institutional memory, whether that has value or not. There's a lot of the people that you're moving, depending on other changes, would not be eligible for reappointment. Thanks. Other committee discussion? Okay. Um, it is now 4.30 and we have um, a few pages left to go. <laughs> so I am, um, I, I think I'm gonna make the executive decision that 4.30 is, uh, is a long enough day at this point and we will start out fresh on section three, page 12, is that where we are? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we can start out there first thing in the morning, um, again, you know, it's, it is my intention that we are going to vote this bill out of committee. Um, so we want to make whatever 
changes, uh, suggestions, recommendations, and uh, and we will straw poll those as a committee tomorrow um, for uh, for the ease of working through this. If you know you have an idea that is uh, more complicated than a word here or a word there, uh, it would be helpful for you to convey those um, ideas to legislative council before we're sitting in committee tomorrow morning because uh, drafting on the fly is never very comfortable. Um, and I'd like, I'd like not to have to do a uh, major redrafting. Um, and so my hope is that we can resume tomorrow morning um, on section three, go through to the end of the bill uh, and then uh, take a pause if there's anything that we need to do that's substantial redrafting um, and come back to the beginning of the bill right after that uh, so that we can uh, close off sections as we go tomorrow um, when we start fresh at the top of the bill. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, uh, it may be useful. I, I can't get clear whether my, uh, pardon the phrase, intransigence about the reset is, is going to fly. And so you might want to just settle that right now so Becky can draft it before we reappear tomorrow morning. Um, I, I'm not sure where we are with that. Um, I believe we were waiting for a little more clarity on what exactly that means. Okay. Fair enough. And I just think institutional memory is going to be important almost no matter, uh, but you're right. And I respect Mark's interest in seeing who, who's been there a long time. And I, I think that's important to know. Thanks. Becky? Um, if I do receive um, suggested changes, should I incorporate those right now or will they just be discussed and then I can just have language yeah. ready just in case? Let's flag those for decision points and, um, and we can flip to, uh, to a particular piece of language if that's uh, something that someone would like to suggest for inclusion. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rep Pigley. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for, for Becky. Um, so on page 11, uh, that number two in regards to that uh, written copy was something in regards to that. I uh, just want to make sure you did, or if you want some help with that, or, um, you know, something to the effect of, you know, it would be put out in a uh, uh, email blast or other information, something like that. I don't know just what the wording would be, but. Yeah, I think I think we have some other examples where um, reports are electronically submitted, um, and then okay. also we have some language that I can use as precedent for making sure that any reports that are sent to uh, participants or beneficiaries would be consolidated into into one report, so that every so that if they do request a written report, it's not um, it's not you know, multiple reports being sent out to thousands of people. <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks. Representative Hooper. Uh, Madam Chair, if it would help, and uh, I want to be clear, I know what Mark is asking. I could send an email out to the VPIC members and alternates and ask them how long they've been on. And it's just politics. And then distribute it to the committee. very well the last four months. Are we getting a radio in the background? <laughs> okay, that's better. Um, uh, so that would be fine. That would be fine with me. And it, and it was Rob as well was looking for that information too. I think so. We we uh, have asked for that to be presented from the um, retirement office at the treasurer's office as well. So that's okay. Um, <laughs> whoever can get it to us first <laughs> would be nice to have it by email so people can look it over. Okay. All right. Any other questions from committee members? All right. Thank you for your great work today, committee. Thank you, Becky, for uh, taking us through and uh, and helping us understand the, the near final changes to the bill.
and uh, we will be back at it at 9 a.m. tomorrow. All right.